Well, I'm an optimist and I think there are many reasons for optimism. Uh, what confuses many people these days is that we have very different demographic trends in Europe and in Africa, for instance, which are the two most extreme cases with Asia and Latin America somehow in between. In Europe, we are really concerned about rapid population aging and possible shrinking, whereas in Africa, the issue is very rapid population growth. So um, this confuses some people, but essentially we can understand it because this is both part of the global demographic transition. It's just that these different continents are in different phases of this demographic transition. So we've essentially passed through it and Africa is just at the beginning. But there is reason to assume that even in Africa, uh, fertility is going to decline. We've seen this in Asia, very, very steep fertility declines in most Asian countries. And in Africa, it's starting already. The key question is what will be the speed of fertility decline? and what are the factors that contribute uh, to uh, lower fertility. And here we really can identify two main factors. The one is universal female education, basic education. I'm not talking about specialized education, just literacy and empowerment at a basic level and the availability of uh, reproductive health services. And we've seen country after country, if there's improvement on these two aspects, then fertility is likely to decline. And on a global level, therefore, we expect uh, that world population will reach a peak level of sometime during the second half of the century and then essentially stabilize or even start to decline. Well, actually, the more I research about the possible consequences of uh, population aging, uh, the less I actually feel that low fertility, somewhere in the range between a total fertility of 1.5 and 1.8, really is a major problem. It is partly uh, because uh, the, the population is, is not yet shrinking in, in many Western European countries, at least because of migration. So this partly compensates for lower fertility. But in the long run, actually, I think the more important factor is that uh, if the young generation is getting better educated and therefore it will be more productive, then we do not need as many young people. In the heads of most people, this is somewhere around 2.1 or 2 surviving children. Uh, but actually there is no good reason for aiming at this specific level. If we look at, look at the longer term context for economic growth, so human well-being in the broader sense, it may even be desirable to be somewhat below this replacement level uh, in order to allow these fewer children to get a better education, have better health, have better human resources in the broadest sense. It is, of course, true if the fertility falls too low, let's say 1.2 or 1.0 or so, then there is such a strong aging issue that outweighs the others. But it's, it's a matter of the criteria that you pose to see whether or not fertility is too low. Many people correctly point out that in large parts of Africa, population density is still very low very sparsely populated areas that could potentially feed many more people than they are feeding today um, if they use the right technology, if they use the right approach. The problem really is more the relative change. How rapidly does society double? I mean, in many African countries, we have a doubling time of 20 or just a little over 20 years, which is just more rapid then the development of infrastructure can absorb. It's in many African countries, we actually had a decline in the proportion of children going to school for some periods because population growth was more rapid than the expansion of the school system. So I'm not saying that population growth is the main reason for the problems of Africa. It just makes it more difficult. It makes it sort of an uphill battle to expand education, to expand health services and other aspects of them, development. Uh, if the population, particularly the number of children, is increasing so rapidly. It would make it easier if fertility declined. And then it's a self-reinforcing process because if the women are better educated, they will voluntarily want to have fewer children, which again makes it easier to further expand education 
and other services. So this really can trigger a beneficial circle of one positive trend reinforcing the other if we just have the right policies in enhancing the education and reproductive health. It really matters that the broad basis of the population is educated. And then having basic health services, which of course includes the family planning, reproductive health, but other sources of infant mortality must also be addressed. Because as long as there's a high probability that a young child will die, the women and the couples will want to have more children in order to have a certain number of surviving children. So it's the health and the education, and not specialized health or specialized education, but broad-based. That is the key, and that we have seen country after country uh, for those who came out of poverty and have been successful, they followed exactly this strategy. Now, why do some governments go this way and others not? There are some cultural factors, there are all kinds of factors, but generally we can also say that good governance does not fall from heaven. It's, it's not a gift. The people of the country have to work on it. They have to engage and build the good governance structures. And here again, we can show that better educated populations have uh, greater chances, a greater knowledge, greater tools, greater empowerment to build better institutions and therefore better governance.